This video clip is part of the EPFL introductory course on information, computing, and communication. It is the fifth in a series of video clips on computer security. Following the first four clips on the specific subject of information security, this next clip changes to the topic of communication security. Under this headline, this clip will explain how computers can remotely authenticate users across a network using passwords to ensure that they know who is trying to do what to which resources on which computer system. Answering this question in turn raises the second issue, which is how can computer in the first place identify, that is, name or refer to people in the IT world? This is the subject of a later video clip number seven in this series. As we just said, identification is about giving everyone, computer user or person in general, a user ID, a name, or some other form of identifier by which we can designate that person. For now, let us assume that that is a solved problem, that everyone indeed has some name, user ID, or identifier and let us talk about authentication. Authentication is the process by which a computer, or in fact a person, can convince themselves of the identity, that is the user ID or the name, of a user contacting them from across a network, a telephone line, or in fact in front of us. There are three fundamental ways in which an IT system can do so. First of all, by asking the user for some secret that only they know, such as a PIN or a password. Secondly, by asking the user to present something that they are, i.e. some biometric trait, such as, for instance, a fingerprint. Or third, by asking the user to prove that he or she holds something that belongs only to them, typically a token or a chip card. Let us first talk about secrets that users know, pins or passwords. In passing, let us point out that all the things we will say here about passwords apply equally well to user IDs. Many people might argue that user IDs are different from passwords because they're not secret. And indeed, our EPFL user IDs are our first name dot last name dot at epfl.ch, which is indeed not a secret. It is, however, unfortunate as it allows anyone who knows that we're affiliated with EPFL to guess what our user ID is, send us spam, blackmail us, or worse, try to steal our identity. User IDs should therefore also be kept as secret as possible, even though they are not really as secret as passwords. Now, passwords suffer from two related problems. The first one is that they are secret, but they necessarily get exposed when they're typed into an end system for authentication. This is why all systems today obfuscate or blot out password fields when users type them in. However, in addition, you should also ensure that the end device that you use for authentication is not infected by spying malware. The worst kind of spying malware is keyloggers and RAM scrapers, which respectively spy on everything you type or scan the memory of your device for leftover passwords and pins. You should also watch out that no tiny webcam or other camera is aimed at the keyboard where you type in your pin or password. The recent surge in identi identity theft cases is the result of criminals having rigged ATM stations with such extra equipment to record financial card numbers in pins of innocent customers. In any case, it is always good to ensure that nobody is watching you when you type in your password, and elementary discretion consists of looking away when you see someone else typing in their password. The second related problem with passwords is that they must necessarily be transmitted from the end device in which they're typed to the remote computer that wants to verify them. In addition, to be able to verify passwords, the remote computer must obviously have a copy of them. Both transmitting the passwords 
to the end system in storing them at the end system, again, exposes them. Now, to minimize that exposure, they should never be either transmitted or stored as is in clear text that any hacker could capture on a network link or read in the target computer. Instead, they must be what's called salted, which I will explain in a second, and then one way hashed into an irreversible digest before they are transmitted. At the destination, the target computer never sees or saves any clear text of any password. Instead, it also stores only the salted, salted and hashed password, and verification succeed when what it receives from the user matches what is stored in its salted and hashed password list. Now, salting a password means prepending it with some fixed but random number to increase its entropy for reasons that will become clear in a few slides. It should go without saying, but I will say it anyway, that you should never ever reveal your passwords to anyone. Doing so is directly opening the door to that someone stealing your identity and spoofing you or revealing the password to some malicious third party. As the saying goes, if you tell someone a secret, you have to kill them, which is clearly not a reasonable option here. So, do not ever share passwords. There are better ways called delegation to give others some temporary permission to act on your behalf using their password rather than yours. Last but not least, passwords should never be written down for fear that the piece of paper that they're on could be lost or stolen. This in turn means the passwords should be easy to remember, meaning that you may want to use your favorite pet or singer or boyfriend or girlfriend name. However, if they're that easy to remember, that also makes them trivial for hackers to guess. So passwords should in fact be as hard to guess as possible, but of course not so hard that you need to write them down. And therein lies the spell of passwords. They should be at the same time hard to guess and easy to remember, so, never, so you never have to write them down anywhere. Picking such balanced passwords is thus not easy. Witness of this is, for instance, this slide about 2008 accidents in which over 32 million passwords were publicly revealed or broken. This slide gives the list of the 500 passwords that were most frequently found among those 32 million and are thus the most stupid that anyone could possibly choose. Now, when you look at that slide, some of those passwords are very clearly stupid indeed. For instance, the first one, 123456, which appeared over 290,000 times among the 32 million, is very clearly stupid. However, when you look at some of the other passwords circled on this slide, at first blush, you would think that they look pretty hard to guess and, in fact, hard to remember. But look again and think again. They are, in fact, easy to remember, and thus, unfortunately, they're also easy for hacker to guess. For instance, NCC 1701 is the registration number of the Starship Enterprise in the Star Trek TV series. Tux 1138 is the title of George Lucas's first movie. QAZ WSX is a trivial pattern on a QWERTY keyboard. OU812 is the title of a 1988 Van Halen album. And 8675309 is a phone number that appeared in a popular Tommy Tutone song. All these bad passwords from the previous slide may be unknown to you. But the fact that so many people pick them means that they are popular somewhere in the world. And whatever you think of as popular in your native language and culture would therefore unav unavoidably rank high in the minds of your same cultured fellows. The trouble is that hackers know that and leverage that fact to conduct what is called dictionary attacks. What hackers do in such attacks is build large dictionaries such as depicted on this slide. First, they accumulate in their easy-to-remember words in natural languages, dialects, slangs, including popular buzzwords such as we just saw, cute key and digit combinations, etc. Then they add all of those same words spelled backwards or without vowels or spelled in elite speak where letters are replaced by lookalike digits or special characters. 
Whatever you think would make an easy to remember but hard to guess password, they know it and they built that into their potential password dictionaries. Then they one-way hash the resulting dictionaries as if they were password files. And then they automate exhaustive line-by-line -line comparisons of their hashed dictionaries with any real password file that they can get their hands on. And there are lots of those around. Clearly, any line that matches between the hash dictionary and the hash password file automatically gives away what is the corresponding user's password in clear text, unhashed. Now, this is what the salting process we mentioned earlier is designed against. Prepending each password with a random number means that hackers have to hash all of their dictionaries with all possible random numbers to get anywhere. Now, while that sounds like a daunting task, it gets ever less complicated every year with today's storage and processing technologies. In one 2011 test, for instance, 10% of an exposed 860,000 password file were cracked in less than five hours in spite of salting. And this was in 2011. Today, hackers could do much better with today's technology. So the bottom line is, do not ever pick passwords using any of the above lists or tricks. Then, how can you pick smart passwords that are easy to remember, yet hard to guess, by even the smartest hackers? First of all is the question of how long a password should be, and the formula to answer that question is displayed here. The risk that a hacker could break your password with some very small probability r is directly proportional to the length of time L during which you intend to use that password, and to the frequency F with which hackers could try to break that password. It is inversely proportional to the entropy, i.e. the randomness of that password, which is in turn the size of the alphabet A of, in which the password is written, raised to the power of the length of the password P. Now, if you invert that formula to extract the password length p, p must be greater than the quotient between the logarithm of l times f over r and the logarithm of a. Thus, for instance, if you intend to use the password for three months, which we will round up to 100 days, and you assume that hackers could try to guess your password at most 100 times per day, and you want to keep their risk of success below 1 in a billion, 10 to the minus 9, using a password alphabet of 26 lowercase letters plus 26 uppercase letters plus 10 digits for a total of 62 characters, your password would have to be at least 8 characters long. Thus, in general, you should change your password as regularly as practically feasible, you should use password alphabets as large as possible, including special characters, punctuation, etc., if the system allows it. You should limit the frequency with which hackers can try passwords against yours. IT systems typically abort the login process and delay retries after three paste, uh, failed password attempts. It is, however, impossible to limit the attack frequency if a hacker manages to steal a password file even if it is salted and hashed. In any case, whatever you do, you should never ever use the same password for multiple computer systems. Because if a hacker breaks your password in one of these systems, they immediately get access to all of your systems with the same password. Many famous attacks have succeeded because of that in the past. This is called password sloth, when people reuse the same password on Facebook, Twitter, Google, Apple, etc. Knowing how long your password should be does not make it easier to remember without writing down. So what can you do to solve that problem? Here's one possible trick. Imagine yourself, without writing it down, a matrix which is as broad as the necessary password length, say eight columns in this example, and as deep as the number of times per year that you might want to change or need to change your password say every two months, which means you need six rows in this example. Then in some of the columns of that matrix, imagine writing vertically some funny sentence in some unusual language for you. 
In this example, the first four columns spell out how to order sushi and hot sake in Japanese, written in Romaji characters. In some more columns, imagine writing down vertically some equally funny way to refer to the target IT system for which this password is meant. In this example, EPF Lausanne, of which all phone numbers start with 021693. Finally, imagine writing down vertically in the remaining columns some equally funny way to refer to the year for which you want to generate passwords. In this example, 2015, written in Roman digits and prefixed by a string of special characters that you could think of as spelling out the vowels A-E-I-O-U-Y. That way, all your passwords for the six periods of two months of 2015 are defined for your login to EPFL. For instance, in November-December, the password would be S K I uppercase N three Yen uppercase V. The uppercase Yen character is Alt dash on a U.S. international keyboard. For sure. This password does not show up in any hacker dictionary. In inventing your own matrix, make sure some columns of it contain lowercase, uppercase, digits, and special characters, so each password will indeed include every one of those features. Now, you might think that this is a crazy system, as you cannot possibly vi visualize, much less remember such a matrix without writing it down. The only thing I can tell you there is, trust me, I've been using such a trick for the past 40 years and could, but of course will not, tell you in seconds what my passwords for my university account was in February 1980 or will be in November 2020. The gist of the trick is that the funny sentence here in Japanese never ever changes from year to year or from system to system. So within days, you have every line of it planted in your head forever. Similarly, the funny target IT system reference never ever changes from year to year. Now granted, there was no Google in 1980, so you have to come up with new system descriptors as you need them. But once invented, they also never change, so their lines are also planted in your head within days. Now of course, the funny year reference, that changes every year. But then within that year, it is the same on all of your IT systems. So again, within days, you have it planted in your head. I assume none of you changes his or her password every two, three months on every one of all of your internet accounts, and this may be fine as long as you do not entrust too much personal information or money on these accounts. However, for accounts that involve your privacy and your money, be careful, especially if they're protected only by a password. Even if you change your passwords only once a year, or not even that, think of a good matrix of which you may use only one row for low-risk passwords. And if you do not use this trick, at least test your passwords with one of the tools listed on this slide. If you feed the password skin 3 yen v as we designed it above to the how secure is my password tool, you see that a PC could not crack it in five years.